Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the final session. Uh, it's an impressive number that have managed to stay throughout the whole thing. Uh, I'm sure it's nothing to do with the drinks that we promised at the end of this session. Um, so uh, I'm uh, stepping in for this session to chair the session uh, with uh, Helen Bygrave, who spoke earlier. And um, the plan is to, to explore some of the key topics that uh, have come up during the day, what our stellar panel uh, of speakers uh, have uh, thought about during the day, the key messages that they've um, reflected upon. So they're going to be sharing those. The good news is we have no more PowerPoint presentations, just discussion. Uh, so we are looking for some good questions and observations from the audience, uh, including our online audience. They seem to have gone very quiet this afternoon. Uh, some time differences may account for that, but we're, we're looking to you, Belarus, <laughs> Ukraine, <laughs> Sudan, elsewhere. No excuses. Uh, good. So, uh, how are we doing this? I'm uh, going to hand over to Helen. Slight <laughs> 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 mind. Woo! Thank God for Helen. Uh, yeah, so Helen is going to uh, say a few words more, and then we will get uh, stuck into the panel. Exactly. I'm going to talk very briefly, because I want to hear really what the panel has to say. Um, but I just wanted to kind of wrap up some of the um, gaps that I think have been, been brought out over the course of, of the day. And what I'm hoping the panel is going to do is, is try and um, prioritise some of these gaps and come with some... Uh, concrete um, action, action points that maybe we can all together as a community take forward. Um, the first one that I think came out from a lot of the presentations was this issue, it, issue of the guidelines. What do we mean by guidelines? Is there, how do we standardise this, coordinate this, but actually also have a user-friendly in the clinic um, version that uh, enables our healthcare workers to put um, this evidence-based medicine into practice. How do we take that coordination f f uh, forward? And also guidelines around the how-to. How, how do we deliver services? Do we decentralise? Is it safe to tar shift? And what are the um, important research questions we need to have answered to persuade ministries of health to do that and donors to fund that? Second gap, um, the M monitoring and evaluation um, chestnut. We haven't cracked it in HIV, that's for sure. But how can we work as a community to come up with a, the minimum set of indicators for these very, very difficult settings that we're working in? Um, that dilemma between the information we need to improve the service that we're working in face-to-face -face with the patient versus the big data we need to understand what's going on at a population level. What hasn't been talked about so much, and I see as quite a big gap uh, in, in this topic, is the ad advocacy agenda, the funding agenda, and the access to medicine agenda. What, what is happening with that? Because quite frankly, where I go, these medicines aren't on the shelf. So what is the global community doing in terms of um, trying to improve uh, or, or ensure a sustainable medicine supply for non-communicable diseases? And finally, um, how do we piece together um, the res or prioritise a research agenda to answer the key questions that the field is asking to improve the care for the patients? What, what, co what coordination mechanism, again, is needed to put together the advocacy and a research agenda to push this uh, work forward? So what we've asked each panel member to do, they've got three minutes, so we've given them a strict time. Um, we want to hear from them what their take-home message from today is, what they see as the priority gap that the international community should be doing to address these challenges of providing NCD care in humanitarian settings, and what is their specific organisation doing to address some of these gaps. Okay, so I'm going to hand back over to Bayard. Good, thank you. So, so first up we have uh, Slim Slama, who's uh, already had uh, made important contributions today. Um, so Slim works uh, for WHO EMRO uh, and uh, he's really led a lot of the work on non-communicable diseases 
and particularly uh, given the region it, with, with humanitarian crisis affected populations and has really, I think, been really behind a lot of the work on pushing NCDs up the agenda uh, and most recently uh, helping with developing uh, emergency health packages for NCD so it's, it, kits for NCD so it's been really valuable work so your observations please well thank you first for for the invitation and I say for me it's a double pleasure first because I was an alumni sitting here uh, about 10 years ago so it was nice to to be back as a WHO staff and also uh, because of many of the faces that are here I mean we're a bit of kind of usual suspect now we see each other in several um, occasions and I'm also I mean have been sitting on the board of MSF Switzerland for uh, many years and seeing that also MSF is is moving forward the professionalizing what was for me a, a bit of uh, an advocacy uh, for, uh, message for years and think that things are really moving from uh, just the kind of pedway and advocacy to uh, really um, implementation I think it's an important aspect um, I would like to maybe respond to some and highlight some of the questions from a WHO perspective. I mean, we are a technical agency that, I mean, produce normative guidance. And I might say uh, in this field, uh, we need to look at two things. I come from a region, as you mentioned, where we have half of the population displaced in the, re in, in the world are in our region at the moment. We have uh, major emergency and conflict settings, probably the region where we have most important conflict situation at the moment with three, uh, grade three, uh, which is the highest level of emergency at the moment, and also all the, I mean, more protracted situation like in Somalia. So we have a, a huge of immediate response to countries. So I think the work on research, the work on normative guidance should not hinder our technical response that need to be taken down now. So sometimes the data gathering, the issue that require a bit of a delay of thinking, of conceptualization, of operationalizing through a UN system as a WHO, the process sometimes are a bit longer uh, to, to occur. So this should not prevent us to respond. So I think one of my take home message is that if you want to work in this field, you, know, you need to know what is happening there. I think the disconnection that I see sometimes in discussion, you need to know what emergency response means, how they operate at the moment between the various agencies and not just as an NGO perspective or as a UN agency perspective, but how this relates to a Ministry of Health that have to respond at the first place to the need of the population. I think this is the first message is understanding you, the context in which you operate, I think it's an important uh, aspect. Uh, from a WHO perspective, the mandate actually, we receive it already from an NCD perspective, more at the development level. Even uh, as you might know, I mean, the NCD um, global agenda have been moving for more than a decade now, uh, including with an action plan that is going to be revised 2013-2020. Uh, In that action plan, there was already a mention and uh, a mandate given to WHO to deploy an interagency kit for NCD management. And this has been a bit the entry point. Nothing has really been operationalized so far. So our entry point for guidelines was also to say how we can link the minimum standards of treatment with guidelines and with the rational use of drugs, uh, drawing on what exists in development stable settings. And uh, as many of you are aware, I mean, there has been a publication of this uh, WHO uh, package of essential intervention for NCD. Uh, prevention and control in low-income settings uh, with implementation tools. So we are trying to draw as much as possible from, from this uh, guidelines. But to take it uh, one step further, in terms of guidance, I think a normative, there is the normative guidance about how you discuss NCD in emergency in general in terms of prioritization. And there is the clinical aspect of it where we are trying now to develop an NCD emergency kit. So we are in the process of piloting uh, a set, it's a set of essential drugs and uh, supplies and equipment for 10,000 people for three months, a bit like similarly to the interagency kit. Some of you might be familiar that there is for uh, the last uh, two decades, I mean, a kit that has been proposed that many countries are, are purchasing in emergency settings for the general basic PHC needs. So we are trying to adapt it with an NCD specific, focusing on the most common conditions, mainly hypertension, diabetes, as we have said, asthma, 
and the colleagues for mental health who have developed also a kit, uh, a guidelines for mental health uh, in humanitarian settings. So all the drugs that are in the image gap H, which is the humanitarian, will be also included in the kit. So we don't want to make that distinction because there's a lot of trainings and support and capacity building for uh, mental health as well. So the kit will contain those basic drugs mainly for PHC level. So we uh, are now in the process of having a, a finalization of the kit an invitation to bid will be sent next week, and by three months, probably, we'll have the first kit ready for pilot testing in Syria, Iraq. So this is one aspect that will influence a bit what are the priority drugs that countries should also foresee in the reconstruction phase if they want also to integrate NCD as part of primary health care, and trying also to uh, align a bit and influence the donors, because there is a lot of donors saying, we have a lot of requests on NCD, but we don't know we should invest in dialysis, in cancer. Mm. And I mean, of course, I mean, there's a, a lot of needs, as I mentioned, but trying to standardize and rationalize a bit the approach about a package of at least primary health care intervention in, for NCD management, is this, this is one of the first st steps that we try to, to assess. And of course, I mean, we are addressing only one aspect of the building blocks. The human resources, the aspect of what type of trainings, and we are partnering with many agencies uh, working in this environment, including, I mean, uh, MSF and, and others, to try to uh, see what could be the guidelines adaptation. And for this, um, I'm not sure that, that we, we need necessarily to change everything on how we manage diabetes and cardiovascular. I mean, most of the existing international guidelines for most of the NCDs uh, I mean, have a rational approach that are evidence-based. I think the most important questions are more about tailoring it to emergency settings in terms of the frequency of lab testing, some of the chains of drugs. So I think we will really look at what the HIV colleagues have done in terms of the how and making maybe an approach to see if there are specific questions that need some adaptation of existing guidelines. And uh, as Ellen mentioned, maybe uh, one or two pages, I mean, colleagues from Primary Care International that have to leave now have already come out for UNRCR, it was a commissioned work, uh, with very simple guidelines, very nicely put together, actually, in terms of reading. I think it's, it's, it's really, I mean, uh, adapted to emergency settings. I think they need a bit of tweaking to change, perhaps, the questions about the frequency of monitoring. Uh, but I think there are, I mean, elements uh, that are already good in the practices that we, what we foresee here. Of course, from a WHO perspective, we have a kind of stringent process sometimes to uh, really endorse guidelines. Mm. So we are going through maybe those questions to the guidelines review committee, but as I mentioned, it will be more on the how. I'm not sure that we will commission systematic review, and even if we commission them, they will not come out with, uh, I mean, a lot of information about what we need. So the PICOT questions might be more on how to reflect on the how, rather than on changing the content of, of, uh, of the treatment. I will stop there for sure. the guidelines. And yes, yeah, thank you. And uh, we can, I'm just gonna, we'll go through the panel and then we'll take take uh, a load of questions uh, at the end. So, um, can I turn to Difford? <laughs> so, we are uh, very grateful uh, to Jay uh, Bagaria, um, who uh, has stepped in at really the last minute uh, to cover for Chris Lewis, um, to offer some perspectives uh, from, from Difford. Um, it's also difficult for Jay because due to work commitments, she can come earlier today, um, but uh, I'm sure she'll be able to wing it. Um, so Jay is, the public is a public health physician uh, who's worked in a range of uh, international and domestic public health uh, jobs. And she's been at DFID for the last five years, um, including le leading work uh, in South Sudan and also in the Ebola response in Sierra Leone. Uh, and she previously worked uh, for Save the Children. So just a few words would be, uh, sure. would be great from Diffid's perspective. Thank you. So hi, and I'm sorry I couldn't uh, make it earlier today. It sounds like it's been a fascinating day. And I spoke to one of my Diffid colleagues who was here at lunchtime, and she kind of gave me a little brief on kind of how things have been going. And I guess when I think about um, the priorities, I'm going to divide it into three or four, possibly. And I guess the first, and if I think, so starting with context and then thinking about lessons we can learn, um, different ways of delivering and the kind of evidence base and cost effectiveness base. Um, so in terms of um, context, thinking beyond my time at DFID, I used to work at PAHO, 
And in Pajo, we, have, um, we used to have cyclical emergencies due to hurricanes. And there we started a piece of work on older people in disasters. And, number of, and part of the rationale was that older people suffer from different types of NCDs and we weren't planning for them. So they weren't, um, during an emergency, they were more seriously affected by an emergency and we weren't able to kind of ensure they remain productive and healthy and happy after an emergency. And so I think there's a, there's a thing about thinking across different regions of the world where um, and different types of emergency. So we're, I think the NCD agenda in crises in kind of humanitarian settings has really moved on, particularly since the crises in the Middle East. But that's not to say that other, other types of humanitarian contexts also need us to think about um, NCDs in a different way. Um, while I was at Save the Children, um, it was as the Libya war uh, crisis started. And there, as, as you said, Slim, the type, you know, NCDs is a hugely broad range of conditions and can range from things that can be fairly simple to treat and fairly simple for people to control to much more complex. So the requests for chemotherapy or the requests for renal dialysis were, were significant during that crisis. And so I think we need to think about, well, what can we do within a limited resource base? What is cost effective? What can be supported in challenging contexts and learn from um, the HIV context as well. And I currently work on HIV, TB and malaria. And one of the things we've been thinking about is how do you maintain people on treatment for chronic diseases in the event of an emergency? What kind of packaging can you give people so that they have more ac you know, longer access to their drugs? Or can you preposition things? Or can you um, have community members with access to these commodities that they then take with you? So the different ways of delivering. So it's, it's probably reflecting a lot of what you've discussed during the day. But I don't know that we've got it right in the HIV world either. And we are still working on it and trying to think of how you test um, and treat people, but also prevent um, kind of uh, the sort of problems from emerging following a humanitarian crisis. And so then I think it comes to kind of DFID's role in thinking in non-communicable diseases. If we think about it outside of a humanitarian context, we very much merge it into our health system strengthening work. So at country level, it's part of our primary health care programming in some countries. And there are some pilots that are happening. Um, thinking about how to integrate it into the essential medical kits that, that are often ordered, particularly in chronic um, settings like South Sudan. So the essential medical kit there did have basic drugs. It didn't have complex mm -hmm. drugs, but it did have basic drugs for some non-communicable diseases. So thinking about what you can do in those contexts in the humanitarian setting, obviously our work in Syria um, does include some programming around non-communicable diseases, but I unfortunately don't know the specifics of that. Um, and more broadly, I think part of the challenge for us has been um, the limited data and evidence around it to actually make um, really good decisions around, um, around non-communicable diseases. So I think that's probably my three minutes up. Hey? Great. Top three minutes. Uh, didn't need to come at all. Uh, exactly. And, uh, yeah, and um, thank you for bringing up the issue of older populations. We have done a systematic review. Uh, <laughs> currently under review uh, on the health needs of older populations in humanitarian crises. Uh, I'll let you guess how strong the evidence base is. Uh, it's even weaker for anything related to NCDs. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so moving on to our third uh, panellist, uh, I've made here the classic chair's failure of not getting the pronunciation beforehand. So we'll do a test of what I say to what it actually is. Uh, so it's uh, <laughs> a pleasure to welcome Sigiria Abisha Peroni. <laughs> so uh, I'm judging by the laughing, I'm guessing that's zero out of ten for pronunciation. <laughs> Could you uh, share with us uh, how it actually should be pronounced? Yes, it's Sigiria Abisha Peron in French, but uh, you can do it however you want because it's just not pronounceable. Uh, that's that's uh, very gracious of you. Um, so please share with us your, your perspectives. So I share with you from the ICFC uh, perspective. I'm also working at the Geneva University Hospital, so I have both, uh, both hats. So I think 
uh, a key issue is access to basic essential medicines like insulin, mainly if you think about uh, conflict settings where we are still not uh, able all the time to deliver insulin like in places like Yemen and demands are very, very high. I think that's really something very important. And also the definition as uh, also WHO is stating of uh, basic and essential medicines for uh, non-communicable diseases where we are uh, currently on the list which uh, uh, WHO is, is working, issuing also our own list of uh, medicines. So to be able to guarantee continuity of care across health structures. I think also that's something we have to see because the patients in emergency settings, in crisis and conflict, they are not bound to one health center. So if they move from one place to the other, they have to find the same type of treatment. So I think this is a key priority uh, in uh, the humanitarian world. One. Uh, other issue is uh, for the continuity of care to draw the lessons from HIV and TB programs and also mental health programs. And also in this highly vulnerable population who moves from one place to the other, you know one, you have them once in your consultation, but you don't know when you will have them next time. So one key issue will be to develop in some way this a golden first encounter where you have really to put the package on the patient and to give him clear red flags when to seek help for uh, complications where and also to give a package of medication if possible because you don't know when the next time he or she will have access to health care. Uh, for uh, non-communicable diseases, it's chronic lifelong diseases, so it's very important once we start something that we think also on the long term to have the idea of sustainability of interventions. And there we will need also guidance and to, come a, and to have a common approach how to deal with complications of chronic diseases like dialysis, because these are uh, big issues and where we will need to, to work together. Uh, I think also something very important for the ICRC, it's there, there will be no screening or active case finding in uh, crisis settings, because it would be not at all ethical to diagnose a condition where for which it's not yet symptomatic and you have no access to healthcare and also high burden to the he current existing uh, health system. I think there is a lot of advocacy to be done to work together on this uh, very important topic and to have really a common approach with s similar medication where you can move from one center to the other and also to think about how to have the medical information stay with the patient. Again, patient move from one place to the other, so we have to find a way to have the medical information available at the moment where you have to make uh, medical decisions. So uh, that's uh, many areas where we will have to work on. And also there is more research needed in, uh, for example, thermostability of insulin, where first research has shown that you could give insulin for one month to, to the patients. So this will have to be confirmed. And I think also the ICC is ready to, to go into this uh, area. Thank, thank you very much for that. Can I just pick up on one point before we move on, which I don't think it's come up earlier today, unless I've mm -hmm. just switched off, um, was, was this, this idea of um, uh, not active case finding in mm -hmm. an acute emergency, which is mm -hmm. entirely uh, understandable and, and right from many perspectives. But at what point do you, what criteria do you have for deciding, okay, now we're in a position mm -hmm. to be doing active case finding? Because I, I, it's very difficult to, it's easy for there to be a sort of long-term creep and never to be signed to do active case finding. So we wouldn't do in, in our health facilities uh, active case findings. If a patient comes with symptoms like uh, polyuria, then s which, where we suspect diabetes, of course, then we would check. And also where we would go, it's, for example, in the places where we have physical rehabilitation programs with uh, patients who have been amputated, and there we found out, actually, that sometimes up to a quarter of patients are amputated 
related not to, to war and conflict, but to diabetes. And there we will really have to find a way to refer them, if you just have physical rehabilitation, into the health system to get appropriate care for uh, diabetes, because otherwise all the rest doesn't make really sense. Okay, thanks. Uh, moving on to, to Anne from UNHR, who you've already uh, met, uh, who's nodding away there, so you may have something also to, to say on that, but please go uh, ahead. Um, well, maybe on the issue of the active case funding, I actually think it's a very good question, and I think it's um, we are really lacking guidance on this. There is for TB, like for example, you don't do active case funding until you can achieve, until you can be sure of achieving a certain level of um, of um, cure. Um, I think obviously you need to have those services available, and they need to be a reasonably good standard and you need to be um, sure that you have the resources to um, do this as well. We are actually considering doing active case funding for diabetes and hypertension in one clinic in Zartri camp um, through the clinic and uh, and then actually monitor and then actually evaluating that um, uh, so that is something that I think we do need more more guidance on um, but just um, on I I think a lot of it has been said. Um, I think um, we can also learn from other humanitarian guidance. I think somebody mentioned this morning about the MISP, the Minimal Initial Services Package, and I, I think there, there, it, it would be beneficial to have an agreed set of prioritised actions, that regardless of the prevalence or regardless of the, you know, the population that we agree that we are going to carry out these actions and I think the most important thing is to continue those that are already on treatment and and this is um, uh, this is certainly something that we have been doing with new new arrivals in the Middle East uh, and then as the situation stabilizes you go on to a, a, a more comprehensive set of services which is based on which would vary by the prevalence and also the level of services that's available to the host um, community. People are talking a lot about, you know, do we offer, you know, cardiac stents or do we, you know, do we dialyze? But this also is determined by the level, in a, at least in a refugee situation, by the level of services that's available to the host, um, com, com, to the host community. Um, on the issue of what UNHCR has been doing before, uh, the, the before I start to talk about the indicators is. We we have been working with uh, PCEI since uh, 2014. Um, they've conducted a number of TOT trainings um, in in Jordan and in other countries, including Kenya and Bangladesh. And then they have and then they've um, also developed a training manual for uh, the integration of primary of NCD management into primary health care. Um, which we are currently translating or will soon be translating into Arabic. As Slim mentioned, there is also the field guides, the clinical guides. It's a two-page guide. It's a desktop aid that, can, that um, is for primary care um, ma managers um, for the main um, NCDs. Um, we also, um, as we've heard various times today, heard about this informal N NCD group in Geneva. And what we are actually going to do shortly is develop a operational guide for the for the integration of NCDs into primary healthcare in humanitarian settings. Um, and we will be hiring a consultant to do that. And I know that many of you are actually part of that um, of that group. And I think I hope that some of these questions about screening will also be in that um, guidance. But what I I think also is really needed is the um, is I think gaps in quality of care are clear. That that's very very clear. But what is needed as well is an agreed set of indicators, what information do we need uh, and what information should we be collecting and at what stage of the emergency um, should we be collecting it. Um, and you know, it, it may be worthwhile having an inter-agency group to work on, on um, that. 
And this is, I, these, I believe that the sphere guidelines are being revised uh, starting next, um, next year. And I think it would be a good opportunity to put, um, you know, to expand that component of, of um, sphere um, based on the experience of re recent emergencies. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, moving on. Uh, to Tamam Aludat, who is an uh, alumni of the University of Damascus and also LSHTM. Uh, and for <laughs> nearly 15 years, he's been working in uh, emergency and humanitarian responses, uh, both in providing care, but also importantly contributing to uh, some of the leading guidelines, guidebooks, uh, and other publications. So it's great to have you here. Thank you. Um, I need to make three points, but under, under a couple of headlines. One is that NCDs is an artificial construct. They are diseases that have nothing to do with each other except that they aren't caused by a, a, an infectious agent. And the second is humanitarian circumstances aren't equivalent to low resource settings. So in, in that, uh, my, my first worry isn't about things we see very clearly, which we talked about most of the day, which is the high prevalence of NCDs in middle-income country emergencies. That's the Middle East. My worry is that very little other than Kieran's example on DRC has been said about places where the uh, prevalence is not as high. And we are prone to ignoring patients who come and reach our door uh, because we haven't decided yet that NCDs in their context are significant enough. And here we need to not learn, at least as, as MSF from what we've done with HIV, because we've ended up at one point with vertical HIV programs with hundreds of thousands of patients yet failed to admit a single HIV positive patient in an integrated project. And until we can integrate NCDs properly, regardless to the um, burden we'd still be treating it in a way that will disadvantage some of our most vulnerable patients in the world. Those are the kids who have uh, diabetes in, in very low-income countries. And as you heard from Philippa, the countries where we see most of our outpatients are DRC, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Niger. So this is, this is my first point, and, and it leads to the point of, I think, saying it's unethical to diagnose is a bit too harsh because it would have worked if you have a self-contained camp where people can go nowhere and are immobile. But we've talked about mobile populations and their ability to, I don't feel that it's my place to decide for them that you shouldn't know what you have and maybe make decisions that affect your, uh, your treatment. Uh, people might want to sell something, travel somewhere, uh, seek help. It's different from, from what we've done 15 years ago, and, and I think we need to revisit that concept because it applies in some places, but not in others. Um, so my first take-home message is we need to learn how to integrate NCDs in primary health care and take it from the point of view of the physician who treats it and the patient who suffers it, not only the policy makers who, who make the bigger uh, choices. The second one is something that hasn't been mentioned at all today. What about those we cannot treat? I, I, I give you, we can't treat cancers effectively, we can't treat, my, so the patients that come and you can't treat. Uh, what happens now, more often than not, is we send them home. And I've heard it from field colleagues, oh, they have terminal cancer, we send them home to die in dignity. And dying in pain is not dying in dignity. We talk not about palliative care, and that is not appropriate. And you'll find more often than not that when we design kits, we ignore pain medicines, and we ignore, uh, we ignore the ability. And our physicians are scared of giving pain medicines because it's illegal, because it's hard, because they're not trained on it. And if we're going to simplify, we might as, as well simplify uh, uh, a dignified uh, treatment for, for terminal patients. Uh, I think in MSF at least, we've ignored it because we're too focused on saving lives and things that do not save lives uh, sort of drops off the radar. 
The last thing I, I want to say is, is an, on humanitarian isn't low resource. Uh, prioritization is, is extremely different from one place to the other. Uh, the second one is cost effectiveness doesn't mean to us nearly what it means to developmental people. Uh, cost effectiveness is, is irrelevant, at least in MSF. We're lucky we have money, but we do treat hepatitis C at large cost. We do treat, uh, uh, as you've seen in the video, uh, reconstructive surgery for war victims. We do treat uh, extremely drug-resistant TB. I wouldn't drop treatments for NCDs just because they are expensive as a single point. And the last one is, you have to forgive us, but sustainability also isn't as much on our radar. We have moved from not treating HIV patients because we are not guaranteed to stay there for the rest of their lives into saying that if we've been there six months and we will stay six months, we're initiating patients. And then someone else might take it. Someone else, I think it's more relevant in NCDs because there's no resistance. A diabetic patient who gets treated six months survives six months and then in Arabic, we say, God creates why you, know, why you don't know. You know, something will happen, you hand it over, you stay there. More often than not, we'll stay there for 20 years anyway. <laughs> uh, so sustainability is important, but it's not a reason uh, to not treat patients. And, and just to finish that, I'll quote an ICRC icon. Uh, Jean Piquet said in 1979, explaining what humanitarian principle, he said, we will never sacrifice the life of a patient today uh, for the hope of saving another life in the future. And that's probably how significantly different humanitarians think about uh, issues like this. Thank you very much. That brought up Thank a huge you. range of issues. It also brought up one that's sort of barely been touched on is in a way the, some of the ethics that, that these topics bring up. Um, uh, which I don't think we have time to explore today, but we'll <laughs> do another symposium next term. Uh, last but by no means least, we have Carl Blanchet, who's Associate Professor uh, here at LSHTM. Uh, and Carl is also the Director of the New Health uh, in Humanitarian Crisis Centre here at LSHTM. Carl has uh, huge experience working in the humanitarian sector uh, and also uh, in research. Please, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring you back to research. Uh, that's my field, and um, I'm, I'm going to talk about data. So today, we learn a lot about the fact that we don't have enough evidence in this field. The good news is that the same for all the other health sectors in humanitarian crisis. And we've done a lot of systematic reviews, and BAD is not exhausted. It's, it's continuing this hard work and uh, producing a lot of uh, systematic reviews. We always have the same messages. We have been um, commissioned by the SPHERE project actually to uh, document whether their standards and indicators were evidence-based. So we're just in the process, the process of doing that. And we emphasize a lot um, on, uh, we're going to insist a lot on the NCD indicators actually that are very, very weak. So we hope that we're going to influence the SPHERE project as well. And I'm sure you're going to be involved in this process. I think we've got two different types of, uh, of um, evidence that we need. One is about what works, and the second one is about how to implement what works. And what does that mean? That means that depending on the context, depending on the phase of the crisis, depending on the type of crisis, and so on, we're going to have different types of Im implementations. What is important about evidence? That evidence is needed. It is ethical. We need it. Good intentions are not enough. We need to avoid to damage the safety of the patient. We need to avoid to do harm. But uh, secondly, it's important as well, and I don't agree with you, to know the cost effectiveness of interventions. Because we're going to make choices on the most cost effective interventions between one and the other. It's important to know that. We know that. Conducting research in conflict-affected countries is quite challenging. We know that. But there is a lot of evidence from stable settings. And Pablo, you know that on NCDs, there's a lot of evidence. So how can we use better the evidence we have that has been generated in stable countries? 
and, 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 and settings, and then trying to understand a little bit more about the lessons learned from, from these areas. As well, and I'm glad to, to hear that Helen took the example of HIV, there's a lot to learn from other sectors. That's important. When we talk about integration, for example, a lot has been done on family planning, on HIV, and so on. What can we learn from these, from these sectors? If you go back to what is the definition of evidence and what we mean when we mean about evidence in the humanitarian sector, I think I would like to go back to the, to the basics. And I think to me is about systematically collect the right data that is going to be analyzed. And I think that's important. What does that mean? That means first we need to agree, all of us, on what kind of data we need to collect. And the type of data we're going to collect is going to differ depending on the context, depending on the type of crisis and so on. If we talk about surveys, for example, that's going to be different from if we talk about health services management or health services data or, uh, or um, user um, or utilization of services. So I think that's one of the tasks for us is to work together, academics, policymakers, UN agencies and NGOs on the type of data we need to collect systematically and routinely. Secondly, I think evidence is not enough to influence policies and practice. And I think <clears throat> what, we need to, what we have now is a forum of academics and practitioners discussing together. And I think that's important to, to continue this dialogue and to have a shared vision on what research needs to be done and how this research or this evidence can be, can be translated into practice and, 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 and policies. We know that most of the sphere standards, maybe 20% of them are not evidence-based. We know that most of the international guidelines are not evidence-based. They're based on something else, expect consultation and so on. It's important to, to agree on, on how we can translate that. Um, I had 156 56, uh, bullet points. <laughs> What I, want, what I would like is to, to, to um, I think, to, to invite people to continue the dialogue. And I think what we, we can offer at the, at the London School is to offer some space and a forum to do that. So Pablo, Bayard, and I discuss about the fact that this year, what we should do is to organize with you a seminar series on NCDs and humanitarian crisis. Every two months, we can invite some of you, invite you for um, um, uh, open discussions and to, to present some of the data or some of your latest findings or innovations that can be shared with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the, 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 the panel or a public. The second idea, I think, is to continue the dialogue virtually. I think there are plenty of, of virtual forums we can use and platforms uh, in order to continue the dialogue between practitioners academics and policymakers to define research priorities, to define what kind of data we need to collect, but as well to look at all the innovations we have, not only in terms of practice or guidelines, but as well in terms of, of research or, uh, or ideas of, for methodologies like uh, David um, de developed earlier. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Carl. And, and thank you for, for raising those, those last few points. We are going to try and make sense of today. Uh, uh, thankfully, that doesn't really fall to me. Kieran is going to give a, a sort of summary of today um, uh, just before the end. Um, but we're also, we'll be looking at a sort of trying to produce a, a sort of short summary, a written summary of what's come about, but also looking how we can take this forward in terms of, of future activities and not just sort of academic seminars, but also sort of active forums for sharing data, information, uh, experiences and so on. So moving swiftly on to the questions, there were lots of key issues that were raised in these discussions around developing the importance of developing and use of guidelines and uh, importantly uh, adapting and tailoring those to specific contexts. Uh, the need for uh, developing agreed indicators, uh, what else, with the importance of continuity of care and highlighting gaps in the quality of care, learning lessons from mental health and HIV, the critical importance of integrating NCD into primary health care, uh, the issues around active case finding and diagnosis, 
the role of palliative care, which hasn't really been addressed uh, much today. Importantly, the issue of sustainability and different perspectives uh, on the role of uh, cost effectiveness. Um, and lastly, that uh, we're all talking about an artificial construct anyway. None of it really matters. Uh, so, um, are there any questions from the online? Oh, ah, terrible. <laughs> terrible. Thankfully, uh, there's going to be some great questions uh, from us. So, have we got someone uh, with a microphone? Okay, we can do it. Thanks. Do so, um, if we just take the first one, there's one at the back. Yeah. Uh, is there another mic that we can? I think there's someone at the. But, uh, so yeah. Uh, woman up there, yeah. Just say who you are as well. Okay. Sorry, uh, John, we'll just start with uh, the woman up there, okay. if that's fine. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to start by thanking you. It's been a really interesting day. Um, my name is Nina. Uh, Rajani and I'm a East London GP and I also um, I, I've been a field doctor for MSF as well um, and I just I guess I just want to something that sort of popped up as I was listening to you make a comment is um, that there's definitely been um, an acknowledgement of the fact that this art sort of this idea of a, a non-communicable disease as being a bit of an artificial construct um, and the issues that arise with that but also, um, I was just also thinking about this idea of just like kind of lumping together humanitarian settings as well, because, um, and what made me think about it is um, I was working in Jordan this year, and um, the main project that I went out to work with was on the uh, Jordan-Syrian border emergency intervention, um, where we were very much um, focusing on NCDs as well as reproductive health care and dermatological diseases and the rest of it. But also, um, while I was while we were waiting for the permission from the Jordanian government to, um, to 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 have access to the border, I also spent some time working at Zatari refugee camp, and you know those those two um, the, those two areas those two um, environments are very very different from each other. I mean, when we were seeing Syrian refugees on the the Jordan Syrian border. Um, in the middle of de the desert that we had to drive three and a half hours every day to get to, you know, uh, and it was absolutely crazy. Um, it, you were really, I mean, we, you'd basically almost certainly going to see those people just just, um, the just the once, yeah. right? <laughs> and you've got to do what you can do in that time. And, you know, whereas opposed to seeing, um, seeing patients, seeing Syrian refugees in, in Zatari refugee camps, some of them who've been there, you know, since it was open, like perhaps up to what is it, three or four years, something like that, four years. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess that's all I just so wanted to. Great. So the importance of, of context and these, yeah. which is the point that you made this morning as well, this hugely sort of varied uh, native challenges in providing care in very, very different circumstances, and from a research perspective, the bias that's really gone towards much more stable settings. Good, uh, John. John Yudkin, um, I just wanted to make a suggestion that case finding and diagnosis of a condition like diabetes may be unethical in a humanitarian crisis situation. Um, and my construct is going to tie in cost effectiveness, uh, whether NCDs exist or whether they're an artificial construct, and what works. Now, I think that we've got completely stymied by what works, that anything where you can do a trial and the p-value is less than 0 0.05 for effectiveness, it works, and NICE will approve it. Now, risk factors are different from diseases. Risk factors are a continuous variable that goes, um, has a distribution in the population, and above a certain level, you call it hyper something or other, cholesterolemia, tension, glycemia, um, hyper cigarette smoking, um, lungemia. Uh, they're risk factors, but when you turn that risk factor into a disease, what does it mean? Um, okay, if you've got diabetes, sorry, if you've got a, um, a hypercholesterolemia and you put 
somebody on a statin. The 4S trial took 4,444 people after a myocardial infarction and showed that there was a significant benefit from simvastatin. The big studies now are 15,000, 20,000 people, and you get a p-value of less than 0.05. Now, what does that mean? It means numbers needed to treat are 50 or 100 or 200 people for five years or 10 years for one person to benefit from a, non -mi from a non fatal myocardial infarction. Diabetes treatment works, but it works UK PDS. What is the end point? Um, microalbumin minuria, not clinical renal disease. There's never been a study to show that clinical renal disease, end-stage renal failure or blindness is prevented in type 2 diabetes. Yet if you're going out and case finding people with type 2 diabetes to put them on a treatment where NNT equals 200 for 10 years to prevent sure. uh, a non-clinical disease, can I, can I sorry taking to, care away yeah. from people who need it. Yeah, sorry to interrupt there because I, I, it's an important point. I'm conscious of time, but I know there's people that want to respond to that, so it's just to give them time to respond. Pablo, did you want to? Yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, it's related with the, I think the, the, some of the the last comments, I mean, we were now querying, well, NCDs is a construct, humanitarian settings, we don't agree, and even, I mean, diseases, because actually, I mean, that argument could be, I mean, put even for diseases. So what are we discussing? And we spend the whole day here. And I think that's part of the challenge we have. I mean, we have here UNHCR, we have ICRC, we have WHO, we have MSF, we have DFID, we have people from CDC, I mean, definitely we are, I mean, we are all facing, I mean, something. It, it exists. We are not making that up. And, and what I hope we can at least uh, try together um, to, to, to get some key questions and some strategies to uh, keep this discussion and working together with concrete examples. And I think we will not argue in everything. And I think, it's, uh, I mean, Tamar uh, raised some ethical issues that also, I mean, could be and, and will be really interesting to discuss. But I hope, uh, and th that's, I, I'm repeating what I said at the beginning of the day, uh, the, th I mean, th the expectation of this symposium is not just to have a academic discussion, but if we can identify key issues that we want to work together and the way we're going to uh, tackle some of the problems we are facing. Defining them is already, it seems, one of the, <laughs> of the problems we have. Thanks, Pablo. Was there any? Yeah. Come on. I need to qualify my statement a little bit. Uh, it was absolutely important to put NCDs on the agenda 10 years ago to talk about after the global burden of disease of 2004 and the, the changes that, to say, okay, this is important enough for us to talk about it seriously. Now, staying there is not necessarily productive because we've talked, we've talk, why, is why isn't there any activism about it? or the, the simplicity of advocacy. It's probably easier to advocate about type 1 diabetes and access to insulin than it is to talk about 20 different diseases with, with multiple different problems with access. And so is access to medicines, issues, and so on and so on. In, in parallel, we don't talk about the hepatitis uh, in, in the humanitarian settings. We talk about hepatitis E causing outbreaks because of water. We talk about hepatitis C and the access to the new generation of treatments. That's what I, I'm not advocating the ignoring them. I'm advocating the going a little bit deeper into knowing exactly what we want with them. On, on John's point, uh, you're absolutely right. And I don't think anyone proposes us going and leaving the, the mass mortality we're facing from nutrition or infections and dealing with, with uh, risk factors. We've rolled that out long time ago in our discussions. We aren't going to treat asymptomatic, undiscoverable risk factors. We're going to tr treat life-risking, very symptomatic and painful diseases. And that probably the symptoms is the, the line we're drawing between the risk factor and, and, um, and the disease. And, and just one last word, because you know, you're absolutely right. We've drawn this in a, recently on a, in a discussion about humanitarian ethics. What is humanitarian is a philosophical decision that is made in a headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> but how you deal with it is, is a different issue. Who decides whether a certain population movement is a humanitarian crisis or, or, or not should, should ne not necessarily affect the way as physicians we perceive our patients 
when we deal with it because there are way too many confounding politics in, in what we describe as, as humanitarian or not. Did anyone else want to respond to these points? We do have some more questions as well. Well, maybe some aspect, um, I mean, working with member states is a bit <laughs> different when you work with an NGO or from, I mean, a programmatic perspective. Uh, the sustainability, the issue of cost effectiveness are part of the equation. I mean, I'm an internist by training, of course. I mean, that issue of the human being, the patient-centeredness, uh, the people's centeredness rather than the patient, I think is an important component yeah. of it. But for Ministry of Health also, they need to make decision. And for those countries at the moment I'm dealing with that have both, I mean, a kind of development and emergency agendas that are blurred and have to respond to many, I mean, challenges, you still need, I mean, to put forward for them, I mean, supporting them in making those choices. And the choices, I mean, need to be perhaps made, made explicit in how you decide. At the moment, like I give you an example, uh, in we are supporting Yemen. Yemen didn't come out to us with uh, diabetes type 1 as the first request. It was a request on 150 medicine for cancer. How do you respond to that? I mean, in terms of how you prioritize those conditions when the Ministry of Health comes with something that for you might seem irrational, but you still need to respond mm -hmm. to it and trying to make, I mean, those decisions together. I think so, this is also the approach is from a WHO perspective, putting that normative guidance of how, how you explicitly think about things that sometimes you have uncertainty, you don't have the right evidence, but you still need to formulate a response. This is why I was mentioning in my introduction that we need to respond now. The urgency is now, while at the same time building from that experiences the future response so that we, we can improve together. This is where also agencies, advocacy, uh, I mean, someone mentioned about NCD Alliance. We contacted them. Some of them, IDF, are training people. I mean, some diabetologists, even specialists, are training, I mean, some colleagues in the emergency response. But we are trying progressively also to make a sense of what kind of message we want to convey, uh, first to the member state and the, to the entire community that respond given the fact that some agencies maybe are not concerned with sustainability, but our member state, I mean, I like there was one report of WHO that really like in the title, but also in the content for mental health people, is building back better. Mm. That takes actually example of in emergency setting in mental health response, how we can use it to build better in terms of, of responding. And I think one aspect that I'm covering is both in emergencies, but also NCD integration in primary health care from a system perspective. We need to do that system analysis and help countries to understand beyond the crisis what could be the basis for a better response. Yeah, and I'm glad you raised that point of, of the broader health system's implications for this, which hasn't necessarily come up hugely. So the good news is we've got a question from our online audience. Uh, the bad news is it's already been answered uh, by you, so uh, apologies for that. So I think we have time for one final question, uh, and then Kieran is going to wrap up for us. Please. That's a lot of pressure on me. Um, my name's one. Pete Skelton from Handicap International. Um, thank you to the panel. It's been a really fantastic afternoon. And people have touched on points, and we've heard, I think, age and, and disability mentioned very, very briefly towards the closing. And I just want to say that, that these vulnerable populations and NCDs are inextricably linked. I mean, the connection between the two is, is incredibly profound, and that these groups are often very neglected in our humanitarian responses. The focus of today has been on improving care of people with NCDs in humanitarian settings. Um, and until we as a humanitarian community, I think, get better at including these groups, particularly people with disability and, and older people within our responses, and I speak particularly from an emergency medical perspective, we're going to fail um, to respond properly to, to the NCD issue, I think. So I wanted to, to open it up to the panel and maybe to the room to see if anybody had any uh, tips on how they've actually managed to, to better include those populations within their programs, because I think even within the data that we've seen, we've seen that they are neglected. Thank you. Thank you for that. Experts. So I, I can tell you from the uh, physical rehabilitation programs. So uh, there we realized actually, as I, as I told before, that many patients are amputated due to diabetes. And now we are looking into how to refer them into the health system for 
proper diabetic care, and also what we are looking into now to use the time when they are in our centers to be rehabilitated, to work, and that would be uh, on uh, also on healthy lifestyle because there we have time because that's then in more stable uh, settings. So yes, I think it's a, it's a priority because they are already there with complications. So if we don't want them to, to go ahead with amputations, we have really to do something uh, for them. Any other comments on, on the yep. vulnerable Maybe population? just briefly, um, I work with Petra Schroeder from Handicap International. When we initially actually started the kind of informal group on NCD and emergencies, I mean, Handicap was also involved, and, and they raised, I mean, that point of the, also the, the issue of amputation in diabetic patients part in particular. But uh, uh, we were at that time also, there was a convention for disability that came out, I mean, at the UN level. So we, we are trying also to operationalize this with our member state. At the regional level, we have, I mean, we'll have the, the, the next regional committee there was uh, one uh, specific element about assistive, uh, assistive devices for disabled people, including for in emergency settings that we are uh, to talking about. Colleagues from HQ have already issued a couple of years ago, there was a uh, um, recommendation and a policy guidance on disability in humanitarian settings. To what extent this is operational on the field, I must say very little almost nothing, uh, apart from those, uh, I mean, groups like ICSC that have specific programs, uh, at least from what we see from the member states, this is still a very neglected uh, field. Yeah. I, okay. I think that's one of the issues, and there are specific programs and specific organizations, but as with NCDs, it's not mainstreamed into humanitarian and medical responses. So as NCDs need to be mainstreamed, so does disability and, and older populations, and only by doing both at the same time can we, can we really reach both goals. Thanks for that point. Kieran, did you have something you wanted to add on that? Um, <laughs> just, just very quickly, just to say that um, in, in programs where we are delivering NCD care, particularly diabetes care, we do always include uh, wound care and, and diabetic ulcer care. So obviously thinking ahead in terms of preventing those the, the, the amputations. But also uh, teams in Jordan have set up... Um, uh, home visits after they tried doing taxi consultations, as they called it, which meant which was uh, people with mobility difficulties who couldn't physically get into the clinic were consulted in a taxi outside, and that raised confidentiality issues. So they then started actually doing home visits and have a 200-person home visit cohort. I think this is one of our key interests: is trying to identify the really vulnerable uh, populations, and, and these are some of the ways to, to do it. But as Taman points out, they're not might uh, might not always be considered cost-effective. And, and it's 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 interesting because what's you know far from the eye, far from the heart. Sometimes you don't see them, you don't yeah. look for them unless that someone comes. And for example, our collaboration with the Handicap International in Jordan is because we're actually effectively amputating them in, in the surgical hospital that deals with war uh, surgeries. Uh, so we we have at least grown. A step further and we have asked for the help of physical rehabilitation from handicap international looking effectively for people that we haven't you know that is is yet to be done and and it's very interesting the parallel I draw is when when we had refugees running from Sudan from South Kordofan one of the revelations I've seen like open the eyes and people of people is when people couldn't carry on anymore walking they dumped the older people on the side of the street. And we, when we figured that out, we went and collected some and we didn't manage to get some. No one would have thought about it until we seen it. And then our international president wrote a paper with Help Age International on the issue. We need an eye opener sometimes to, to figure out things that we're, we're subconsciously ignoring. Thank you for that. I think that's uh, perhaps the take-home message from uh, today. It wasn't scripted, I, I promise you. Um, so uh, we're going to hand over to, to Kieran now. He's going to give some concluding remarks uh, and thinking about the, the sort of next steps going forward. Uh, and I'd just like to, to thank our panel very much for participating. Thank you. Thank you.